We begin a new series this Sabbath morning. We just finished up a week of intense look at the Beatitudes, found in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. And we included salt and light in that so that not only are we blessed because we are, find ourselves in different positions, but then God says, hey, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. It's not just okay to sit in your spot. There's movement and purpose for what I have for your life. And in preparing for that, it became apparent to me that we couldn't just leave it alone and say, okay, we did the Beatitudes, cool, we're moving on. Because I began to immerse myself in what scholars call the Sermon on the Mount. It's Matthew chapter 5 through 7. Luke also records it throughout his gospel, but the bulk of that sermon is found in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. And today we continue the journey of our look through the Sermon on the Mount that will take us all the way up to the week before Christmas. Is it too early to play Christmas music yet? Okay, I heard a yes. Yep, yep. Some of you are like, nope, I've been playing it since July. Um, Been loving it, right? So this is going to take us all the way up till Christmas. We've got a big portion that we're going to look at today, and then we kind of slow down in the coming weeks. And it's going to be under the title, Righteousness by Heart. Because as I was diving into the Sermon on the Mount, it became apparent to me that Jesus does not pit righteousness by faith versus righteousness by works against one another. He puts them together. And it's as we have faith in God that it wells up inside of us an outworking of the grace that God has provided to us. Righteousness by heart. That's where we begin this morning. So as we open up scripture, let's bow our heads one more time for a word of prayer. God, thank you for today. As we open up scripture for just a few moments this morning, as we come before you in worship, God, may we see your heart. And may our hearts be transformed. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you got your Bibles, Matthew chapter 5, we're going to begin in verse 17. It'll be up on the screen for you. Or you can turn in your paper Bibles or scroll on your digital Bibles. Whatever you've got, I'm going to be in the New Living Translation. Uh, but whatever you've got in front of you is just okay. So Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20 is what we're going to look at first. And let me tell you before we get into it, I, I don't like this section of the Sermon on the Mount. It makes me squirm. But then I realize the passages that make me squirm the most transform my heart the most. And so I've got to lean in just a little bit more. So if this morning, if things get uncomfortable, embrace it. Embrace the storm, embrace the challenge, because going through it, you'll find yourself in a closer relationship with God. Jesus, after finishing the Beatitudes, telling us about salt and light, continues his sermon, Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Do not misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's law and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. There's a shift in Jesus' language. He's been talking about how this group is blessed and that group is blessed. And we're the salt and the light. We're like, Jesus, yes. Take me as I am. And he says, hold on. I'm going to raise the stakes on you. Because see, you have a misunderstanding and a misconception about the law. And there was a group of people that was present at this sermon that was trying to find a way that, Jesus, you're changing the law of God. You're keeping it a little bit different. You're not following the ways of Moses. And he says, please, do not understand me. The laws of Moses are completely and 100% valid. I did not come to abolish the laws of Moses, but I came to fulfill them. He says, you better believe that the very, not even one last stroke of the law will be removed. All of it is valid. And he's shifting for us how we perceive this law. He says, no, 
that's the thing you've got to keep. And it's like, Jesus, we read in the scripture about how it's, it, there's grace and there's mercy. He says, I'm not talking about that right now. The law, you must keep the law. And he sets up this impossible situation, right? He says, unless your righteousness is better than that of the righteousness of the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. It's as if Jesus sets up the basketball court, calls you out and says, okay, it's 1v1, LeBron's on the other side, check the ball in. And you're like, some of you are like, I'll, I'll take him on. Like, I got it, right? But then others of us are like, there's no way I'm winning in one-on-one versus LeBron in the basketball game. Jesus sets the stakes extremely high. He says, hey, if someone teaches against this law, they're considered least in the kingdom of God, but the ones who teach it, And abide by it. Those are counted as great. You won't be a part of the kingdom of God unless you surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees. I think this surpassing that Jesus puts forward for us is not this outward show that's like, okay, I get, I check the list off and I got everything right. No, no, no. Jesus is saying your surpassing of the law will go much, much deeper than what the Pharisees keep. From my reading of the Sermon on the Mount and from this passage this morning, I'm 100% convinced that God is interested in loyalty, not legalism. Because we can look at the law and we can say, okay, here's all of the things that I've got to keep and Jesus says we've got to do it. And he says, no, 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 no. You must surpass. You must go deeper. You must go beyond what the Pharisees and the keepers of the law do because I'm after your heart. And I'm after you keeping the law in a way that honors me and that is loyal to who I am. And then the question that pops in your mind and it popped in my mind as well, and you're like, well, how do we go about that, right? How do we practice this law that you're talking about? If our righteousness is supposed to surpass it, what, what must we do? And Jesus then takes those people on that mountain. He takes us through six different case studies about how the law is different than what we first perceived. I'm not going to put it on the screen for you because we're going to go kind of quick today. We could dive in and dissect each and every one of these things, but there's a bigger picture that I want you to catch today. The first one found in Matthew chapter 5 verses 21 through 26 read this way. You've heard that the ancients were told do not murder, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Whoever says to his brother, Raka, you good for nothing, will be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into fiery hell. Jesus says, you've heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I tell you, you're committing it if you're angry with your brother or your sister. Because you're harboring hate in your heart. Your heart has not been transformed by my grace. He continues on with the second case study. You've heard it said, Matthew 5, 27, and you've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery in her heart. Jesus is saying this to say that the root of the issue comes in the heart. You would not act on something you have not already thought about. If it weren't for the barriers that were in place, you would have already committed the action. Matthew chapter 5, 31 through 32. It is said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, anyone who divorces his wife makes, or makes her commit adultery. Jesus says, by doing this action, you're marring the image of the original intention of marriage, the beautiful image that it paints of God, the fidelity and the relationship that has been broken. Matthew 5, 33 through 34, you shall not make false vows, but I say to you, make no oath at all. Let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything else is evil. Jesus says, let your words be true and upright. Leave no room for error. Say what you're going to say and hold to your word. Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 and 39. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. Jesus is after the heart. He says, yeah, you've heard that. and You've totally misconstrued my intention behind that. The world operates under transactional relationship. The kingdom of God uh, operates under transformational relationship. He says, the issue is in your heart. And then he turns and he looks everyone in the eye in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. And he puts it this way. 
you have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives, us, uh, gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Jesus sets the bar high. He says it's not just good enough to love your neighbor. Anybody can do that. As annoying as they might be, they're your neighbor, right? Your brother, your family, as annoying as they can be, their family, their blood. Jesus says that's exactly it. But when you do that towards your enemy, you are acting as a child of God because children in the kingdom of God love every single person they come into contact with. And that love is not born of something that we muster together. No, it's the grace-filled life lived out. That as the transforming power of Jesus comes inside of us, it causes our heart to beat differently. We look at scripture and we see the words of Jesus. Our our hearts begin to beat in the rhythm of unceasing grace born from the throne of God. And perhaps this last case study, love even your enemy, it's perhaps the root of the entire teaching that Jesus has laid out. Anyone can love their neighbor, but what good is that? Loving your enemy is the ultimate example of a transformed heart, and it summarizes the rest of these case studies that Jesus brings out. Because you see, God is interested in transformation, not just transaction. He's after your heart. Illustrate it for you this way. A number of years ago, going off to college, leaving my parents' home, we cried in the gym parking lot. And I would never go back to live in my parents' home as a member. Always welcome, stayed over, you know, but then it's a a watershed moment. And I remember leading up to that, you know, you're a high school student, parents are paying for your phone. My dad pulled me aside right before I'm heading off to college, and he said, hey, I'll pay for your phone. I said, sweet, yes, absolutely, that's a good thing. Under one condition, that you call your mother every week. I was like, okay. Like, sure, yeah, like, my mom's a nice person. I'd love to call her, right? And, then the, the, you know, the, the teenager inside of me is like, man, that's a harsh rule, Dad. Every week? Just like once a month or something? Like, some of y'all do that, and you need to call your mom, okay? Somebody sitting here, like, you need to call your mother today. This is the word of God for, from, for you today. But I remember as I began to call each week, I called at first because I wanted to make sure that I had a cell phone. But as I continued to call, I grew in a deeper relationship with my mother and my father. Because I called my mom, she'd put it on speaker and be like, we're here, we're on speaker, tell us all about your week. It's like call on Friday night, right? And it's only as I've grown a little bit older that I realized that my dad had to give me a prescription in order to transform my heart. And I think in some ways God does the exact same thing. Because what my dad was after was a relationship with my mom. And if it took paying my cell phone bill, that was chump change compared to anything else. I think God operates in the same way. That his law at first can appear as this checklist of things that we must do. It's like, all right, God, yeah, I'll keep the Sabbath and make sure I stay away from the unclean foods. You know, worship on Sabbath, like do the thing. You know, make sure everything is good to go, treat my neighbor well and all that kind of stuff. But if we truly commit ourselves to the way of Jesus, we begin to emulate the person that fulfills the law. Jesus did not abolish it. He did not set it to the side. He said, I am the fulfillment. This law is a definition of my character. And when you emulate that, you emulate me. He puts it this way in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, read a moment ago by Keith. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give 
you today are to be on your heart. It's not a checklist you pull out of your pocket, you keep on your phone. No, he says on your heart. And then he corroborates that in Proverbs chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. Keep my commandments and you will live. Guard my teachings as the apple of your eye. Hold them so close that they can be reflected in the reflection of your eye. Bind them on your fingers and write them on the tablet of your heart. You see, a, a, a grace that comes from God, there's grace in the law. It shows us the path. It unfolds for us the character of God. A grace that transforms the heart produces righteousness. The heart that's transformed by grace will choose love over hate. It will choose relational fidelity over instant gratification. It will choose integrity over dishonesty. It will choose transformation over transaction. Love for enemy over contempt. You see, the Jews kept the law, but members of the kingdom of God respond with their heart. It took a few months, but I began to realize the, the wealth and the beauty of a regular conversation with my mom. I think God looks at us the same way. He says, my child, you're striving for something. It's not just enough to say, yeah, I called, cool, we're good to go, but we must lean in with our hearts because that is what God is after. He's after your heart. Not about transforming your outward appearance or your, your actions or, no, 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 no. This child, give me your heart. Let me lean into what beats inside of you and let me align that rhythm with my unceasing rhythms of grace.